Guaranteed Irish business members continue to sustain jobs and communities across Ireland. There's a name you may not know behind many Irish business successes, like helping delivery pizza arrive on time or navigating the property market online. It's GeoDirectory, Ireland's leading data intelligence expert. See how our powerful data toolkit can help you verify addresses, identify opportunities and win customers. Visit geodirectory.ie today. So look out for the G, guaranteedirish.ie, all together better. The Sunday Papers on Off The Ball. And you're welcome back to Off The Ball here on News Talk. John Duggan sitting in for Joan Malloy until 7 on your Sunday. Time now for the paper review. We're delighted to be joined by the GA and horse racing rider with the Irish Independent, Michael Verney, and the soccer correspondent of the Irish Times, Gavin Comiskey. Michael and Gavin, how's the form today? Good, job. Very good, very good. How are you? Great to see you both. Um, let's go through the back pages to start. Uh, the Sun... So we have uh, Jim set for more men. This is happening, apparently. Jim McGuinness can be involved in the coaching setup with Down. Fascinating story. And the, so many Jim McGuinness stories over the years, but this has got legs, this one. This is actually happening, we believe. Uh, Casa Hero, Andy Zero, Man United 3, Reading 1. Andy Carroll sent off as a, it was a Brazilian fiesta. At Old Trafford, as Man United continue their winning run. Uh, anyone else would have copped it. Jurgen, past glories have spared me the axe. Uh, Liverpool are just about to kick off against Brighton in the FA Cup with Evan Ferguson starting for Brighton. Uh, we have that's the Sun. Uh, we have the Sunday Independent Sport. Uh, up and running, Dublin begin life in the second tier with a victory over Kildare. Uh, Six Nations kick off. Why we've never had it so good. Arsenal still want Rice despite Casado Hunt. Gunners targeting summer move for West Ham midfielder. Roberto De Zerbi is hopeful of. Uh, Keeping Moises Casado at Brighton, but I think it could be a losing battle. It's interesting, though, that Arsenal and Chelsea have mainly been linked with these players in this transfer window. It's not other clubs, which is, I suppose, you know, indicative of what could be happening. Uh, Sports in the Sunday Times uh, supplement Ireland's rising star Dan Sheehan talks to Peter Riley. Casado told to stay away as Arsenal increased bid and Brazil 3 Reading 1 Casemiro and Fred on target. Anthony manned the match as United advance in the FA Cup. Welsh boss uh, to quit in rugby after a week of shame says Stephen Jones uh, so the chief executive of the Welsh Rugby Union will resign Steve Phillips actually he has resigned so he has resigned that story's moved on after that scandal in Wales. We've got the back of the Daily Mail uh, on a Sunday. Brazilian United move to Samba Beach as Casemiro and Fred lead Reading on a merry dance in the FA Cup. And Garth Brooks concerts help Croke Park record 20 million surplus and turn the tide. Ireland need to break the cycle of Six Nations misery in Cardiff. They haven't won there since 2013. That's what's mainly going on, lads. I'm just going through the other ones. Uh, Willie's 4,000th winner is in the back of the Sunday Mirror. Uh, Casemiro, the hero. And Klopp thinks it's all over. Liverpool and City's domination is finished. And we also have the Sunday World. Pool hoping for a bright day. Uh, Jurgen Klopp has challenged his players to erase the memories of their Brighton Horror Show. That was in the league in their FA Cup fourth round tie. Arsenal gonna get Casado. Uh, Fenton's goal seals Dubs win. I hope Pool slump is not terminal, says John Aldridge. And I do believe Ireland will win the Six Nations, writes Mick Galway. Remember, we've got the game against England on St. Patrick's weekend and uh, also an interesting story in the Sunday Times which I'll just try and get up here about um, Cricket Stadium gets a green light so Sport Ireland is given the green light by the government to devise plans for the country's first cricket stadium this is apparently out in the Ireland campus uh, in Abbottstown uh, following a joint bid by Ireland, England and Scotland to co-host the 2030 Men's T20 World Cup Michael I suppose what we're going to start with um, can we finish off the saga today in the Sunday papers about Glenn and Kilmacud? Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. It's it's amazing. Yeah, We're at full time for yeah. everyone in Kilmacud. I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> We're a week on, and I think the CCCC are only going to meet tomorrow. And there's just been so many moving parts to this. Uh, the GA leaving the ball in Glenn's court. Glenn appealing. Crooks counter appealing. Um, you'd say the decision to fix a replay is probably the most likely outcome whether that replay will ever be played and you probably have maybe your finger on the pulse a bit more just near the upper round crocs but well, I don't know if this game is ever going to be replayed No, I didn't jump on the bandwagon there after not being up there for years <laughs> just to get in on the old Ireland but, uh, so You just turn up uh, unannounced with your dictaphone Yeah <laughs> uh, I think it's uh, again I, I got this second hand but just from uh, this relates probably to Glenn as well everyone involved in that chemical Croaks team they can't be taking any more time off. They sacrifice Christmas with family. Any one of them who's a parent, it's it's done, time off. This idea of a replay it has to be, these are amateur club players. The All-Ireland Final, they would have driven towards this. I'm not talking about the sport aspect, or the, I'm talking about the sacrifices you make to be able to play club football for a year. Um, 
once the full time whistle went, it was they there were so many things they had committed to their families. Can you imagine how much time they're working, how helpful their jobs are? And they're not in jobs that are related to their sport. They're in jobs that are related to their mortgages, you know? So it, it, it was over. I, I imagine, and I think I saw this, did John Fogarty wrote this in the Examiner this week, that if it does go the way of you have to do a replay, there was talk behind the scenes that Croaks would be like, no. So they're could, Glen are All-Ireland champions, but... Take a cut back. They've won in All-Ireland and they've celebrated in All-Ireland. And again, to put this back in a sporting context, I was out in Abbottstown um, this week. I must, couldn't see the cricket patch actually being built yet, but I was out there for an FAI gathering for... Uh, they're actually talking about the Women's World Cup. They're doing a media briefing and they were also doing a media briefing ahead of the start of the League of Ireland uh, with Mark Scallon. And it was very interesting, very good. And afterwards, it was a bit of a Q&A and we asked, asked them what would you do if this happened in FAI Cup Final, for example, or something even may- maybe a bit lower down, something that was more amateur or whatever. And um, they said, well, for starters, <laughs> there's a mechanism in place for the FAI to take control as opposed to what the GEA did when they put it all on Glenn. The GEA could have taken control. Re- repu- reputationally, that is so damaging outside of the GEA for Gaelic games in Ireland when you look outside of the country and you go, your showcase event is now a joke. You, you know, it, but maybe the JR's argument is if we get involved uh, from the get go ourselves, we got to ma- we got to then arbitrate every bun fight. Okay, well we what what so we we framed the question for the FAI for the person who makes the decisions. What would you do? Would you let that happen? They were like, no, no, no. We've mechanisms in place for the disciplinary arm of the FAI to take control of this situation and not put it on the team that lost, like. <sighs> When you look at it, because they're amateur players and if so much commitment would a replay, so much would go into replay, most of it's impossible. Some of them are in America. Shane Walsh is gone, I think, yeah. is he? Um, so that's your best player gone. Lots of lads are gone because of probably just childcare more than anything else. So for them, just well, put in a whopper fine, fair enough. Um, take responsibility for the fourth or fifth officials for what where they made mistakes. And if Glenn, if, if Glenn appeal and if the letter of the law can get them to a replay well and good, just... I think just give them the trophy. It's too damaging reputationally for it is, to go is back. Is the into answer it. here not the fine? Fine it and that sorts it. Big time, and then wait for the appeals if they come. But Glenn, Glenn actually, and maybe in a way they f- might have felt that they had to throw this back in the GA. Maybe they don't want to replay, but maybe they felt that they had to throw back the uh, the objection to the GA. And if they find Kilmacud, because it's always about depending on the circumstances, so you're actually not setting a precedent. Then it's sorted. Yeah, it was such a. And the, it wasn't a response from the GA, but it was such a watery thing to do, in my opinion, just to pass the ball into somebody else's court. Like when Offaly and Clare was blown up early by Jimmy Cooney in 1998, there was a replay ordered quickly the next day. Mm. There was no appeals or anything like that. People saw and those the oh, the, the Offaly lads on the pitch though did well, help. That did yeah. help. Now to be fair, <laughs> but. Uh, there was a problem we have to fix the problem we have to come out and address it and I, I just did I, like it was clear for anybody to see that it was 16 technically 17 on the pitch 16 having a, an involvement in that final play you come out and make a decision maybe it hasn't been done before and I, do, I don't agree with that it uh, you know every bun fight or every su- extra sub coming on that it, you, all these things need to be investigated this is the biggest showcase in the club season and we had a farcical conclusion to it and to me it could have been nipped in the bud very very early by the powers of be. Shane, Shane McGrath just writes in the, uh, in the mail today I thought it was interesting he says the argument is that there is a GA way of doing business and that this must be adhered to at the cost of credibility confidence and the integrity of its competitions this is a, fee- it's a feeble uh, response basically the fundamentals of this case haven't changed and only need brief restating one team enjoyed an unfair numerical advantage over the other for the last play of the game that goes against regulations but it is also against the concept of fair play that even a small child could grasp. Like everybody can see the problem here and the GA have made no attempt to fix the problem. And to me, it's just uh, hugely disappointing. I'm a GA man first and foremost and it's a poor representation on our governing body and the leaders within the GA that a resolution wasn't made quickly and they come like it's basic PR come come out and control the narrative make a decision and we move it's on basic leadership as well I wonder though if the club finals are on Patrick's Day and you've all the leagues going on at the same time would it be as high profile the thing about it is you had the split season demanded and the clubs then get much more high profile scrutiny as we saw with the FASA Stuart 10 Harps game and now you see with the club final everybody's looking at it and now this has become a live line topic yeah, it's almost. Has like, I made it to yeah. Liveline yet? Did it? No, no. I suppose good. that's more of a yeah. phrase. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I just do, thought it was. I was do, like, Doug, do, please, do, God, do, if it does, <laughs> I'm done. To be credit to, to credit to Liveline. It's just very damaging and very embarrassing, is what I, I felt looking at it for the association. So when I'm look, when I'm reading the Garth Brooks story, the back of one of the papers there today, and I'm thinking to myself, the amount of money they're making. Uh, 
why can't we have a situation in the GA, Michael, where you have formalised substitutions like you'd have in professional sport, where you have the, the person on the sideline, the fourth official, holding up a board uh, and that they're bringing a number off and bringing a number on. And until that is concluded, play and I cannot resume. Yeah, it normally would be the case, John, to be honest with you. It normally would be the case that somebody's coming on, I've been a sub coming in, you are not let in until somebody comes off, generally, because they run the risk of having 16 or 17 players on the field. I'm not sure what happened, but... Is there no double lock, though? Is there another, not another lock you can put on, aircraft door style onto it? Uh, maybe so, but like if you have a fourth official and you have maybe a referee's coordinator there as well, like it wasn't for an absence of bodies, it wasn't for an absence of communication between all the officials that were there. And like they obviously knew straight away after the 45 that Dara Mullen hadn't come off. Okay, There's a bit of a precedent, and Finney McMahon uh, wrote it in our paper yesterday, Rob Henley had a 45 to level the 2021 All Ireland semi final against Dublin. He kicked it just as he was kicking it, the referee blew because it was an extra Mayo player coming onto the pitch. So it's actually, he got to replay the kick because there was an extra player on the field. But he called it there and then. Henley hit the kick. The second time, it went over and it went extra time. But that's really what should have happened. They would have realised the mistake, I'm sure, pretty quickly. If Mullen came off after the 45, they would have realised, OK, we had 16 players on the pitch here, retake the 45. And I think, I don't know, what do you think, Gav? I think everyone would be happy in that instance if, you know, you've got to... They had an advantage for this one. We've realised it, we take it again. And if they score a goal, they win. If they don't, they lose. Yeah, but the fact that a week later we're talking about it is a leadership vacuum. And that, that's what I see here. And it's... I'm not having a go at the GAA there also because the, their leadership and the way they go about their business is really impressive. But in this instance, I just can't see any other sporting organisation letting it linger in the wind for as long as they have. And like, that's that's the problem here, you know. And it's it just it's doing no doubt. We should be halfway into our, the league has started. We yeah. should be rattling away about the, like, there was a classic between Galway and Mayo last night and we're not because of same old, same old. As I was saying to Michael on the way in, this is, I felt like we were back in 2004 and we're dealing with uh, Tyrone and Armagh going to war with each other. Not, not on, on the pitch for about five minutes and then off the pitch for about three weeks because yeah. they had to get to the DRA. Like, have, we not, have they not learned anything in the last 20 years? That's the, that's the administrative disappointments I'd have. It's an amazing though yeah. that you could be so commercially savvy and say with the Garrett Brooks concerts and the amount of revenue they're able to bring in and commercially the GA are really on top of it, you'd have to say. And then... I don't know if they're also on top yeah. of it in terms of their practices. So when you compare them to other sport organisations and how they've been run over the last twenty years, but then you look at you know the lack of reaction to this and just letting it carry on for a week, and God only knows how much longer it's going to carry on. Uh, Joe Bradley, the only way to get rid of the stain is for teams to do it again in the Sun Independent. Uh, he's been blowing that trumpet now for a few days, hasn't yeah, he? Yeah, well, he's been he's kept to his principles, including on this station. Uh, so I just want to quote this. Stevie Mercer from the Glen Club rang me after I did a radio interview to say I'm 1-5 to five to win the Pat Convery Memorial Clubman of the Year Award. This will be the first time in his history the prestigious trophy has been presented to an outsider. I will, of course, have to do what our own Colin McGuigan did when he was awarded a medal for bravery by the Queen. He sent it back. It's a northern thing. In his early 20s, Steve he emigrated to the US on the eve of his departure there was an Irish wake from the Glen Glen Clubhouse at the very end of the night Stevie became a very sentimental and took the mic with tears running down his face he pointed at the crowd with voice heavy with emotion said you're my people you will always be in my heart which got a great ovation and Stevie's very popular off he went like Dick Whittington only to return a month later (laughs) <laughs> the poor fellow was homesick. I don't think he's left the parish since. So, bit of uh, humour in the whole thing. And, and, and to be fair, like, like Joe Brody's pointed to Claire Offley, as you said there. He's pointed to um, Dunboy, ne- Navin, and Mahoney's like precedents and technical errors. And, and in these cases, replays have happened. Yeah, um, I'd say a replay is the most likely decision. I still find it hard to believe that it's actually going to happen, especially with if you look at the like. Close Don't these it? lads have hold, they've they've moved on with their lives. Every yeah. single one of them, they're in off season now. Every single player, sure, a few, two of the Glen lads played for Derry years. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Ethan Doherty and Conor Glass played for Derry yesterday. You know, six days later, they obviously want to move on from it. I'd say as well. I want to move on from it. Yeah, <laughs> uh, five three one zero six. Fintan Malahide. Uh, a final be a joke. Croke's going to raise the fine from a few big donors. Replay or forfeit the title is the way it should be. Um, and John and Cork sacrifices part of sport and the taking power compensates in bucket loads. If you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen instead of just moaning about the heat, just talking about the fact that um, the players are martyrs, message that's continuously promoted by the media and the GA is sickening. The poor players, uh, the players get a, a, a lot out of it and they don't enjoy it, they should stop. They do get a lot of, uh, out of it. They do, enjoy, uh, they do enjoy it, 
but there are a fair whack of sacrifices too, and it's not just their personal sacrifices, it's a spin-off of sacrifices that other people make for them as well, and uh, if you've made them, you'll realise how significant they are, and I, don't, I wouldn't underplay what they do and the sacrifices they make. Uh, we have um, Cork 3 points me the goal in the uh, Allianz uh, National Football League, so we'll, uh, Paul Kerrigan will update us on that shortly. You saw uh, an, an article also in the Sunday Independent uh, about ladies Gaelic football and the availability of pitches, Gavin. Yeah, I'll, I'll give uh, Nadine Doherty, uh, she deserves a bit of credit, is in the first six pars are kind of the best way to get women's sport into national newspapers is you point out how they've been treated but then the rest of the article is a really good preview so <laughs> she, she drags you in really cleverly and then she actually gives you the, the real meat that should be the headline that probably won't get as many readers but she does a very good job very simply she points out Waterford ladies were forced to play their first game of the 2023 Ladies National Football League in Pilltown which is in Kilkenny uh, they've been, Waterford had been training there they couldn't get a pitch in their own county now that's as strong an indictment as you can get. Really, but is Welsh, Welsh Park now, uh, not at the moment being redeveloped? Yeah. Where are the men playing? You know, are the, are the men playing in Kilkenny? I is it far field? Yeah. Oh, yeah, they got the Yeah, actually, yeah. yeah. But yeah, anyway, she, she, sorry, I apologise then, but she moves down then and she talks about how um, Mead and Dublin met and how their match was put up on the, again on the training pitch. Um you know, yeah. Last year, Mead and Dublin played in front of thousands of supporters in Park Talton. Last weekend, the same teams played in Dublin City University, separated from a few hundred supporters by a by a perimeter defence. Uh, Parnell Park was deemed unplayable, but the game should have been moved to a suitable and well well sourced venue with parking, a stand, and toilets for supporters. The journey journey towards parity took a disappointing step backwards. It's like we're talking again about parking, a stand, and toilets for the women's national league. Um, and again, Nadine, opening six powers, nails it, goes, look, they, there's a lot of talk, there's a lot of talk in Congress about moves towards equality, and everything, it, but practically, yeah. there's, there's major problems still. But is that always going to be the case unless you've a merged situation with the GA, the ladies football, and Camogie all in the one, on one umbrella? They are, like a lot of the time, they're Correct. feeding off the scraps. You're waiting to see where fixtures, where male fixtures are, and then you're trying to get the second best. Like, I think the fixtures for the, la- the LJFA fixtures came out the Monday before last, and 11 of the 14 games were TBC, like where the venues were actually going to be five days, including Dublin Me, they didn't actually have a. a and Parnell Park, it. was that not available? Uh, that was unplayable at the moment. I think yeah, four and, of and the, also Croke yeah. Park. Once again, you had the uh, the club finals. Yeah, I think four of the um, four of the fixtures in the LGFA, the first round, were played in the county grounds, and that'll kind of show you how difficult it is to get them. But listen, there's a. The, uh, some of the men's teams are even probably struggling to get in there just with conditions and how much you know a, ge- a game could destroy a pitch at this time of the year that's not making any excuse it's just particularly difficult that's but the argument against double headers because the male female double header thing has, worked, has been quite effective yeah. for you know but again the, arg- the easy argument there for them is well the, if the, we put the, the women's match on first they'll cut up the pitch for the men or, or, vi- or vice versa for that matter but so that seems to be the only thing but the, the double headers thing it just seems like the easiest way of making sure that they're they're given the respect that they yeah. should have earned yeah. by now. Should yeah. have earned a long, long time ago. Just, yeah. I, I gotta go. And the, the FAI. I'm here to def, uh, say how great the FAI is all day today. But Roy Barr taking that step down and basically doing it to ensure there was gender equality or a move towards gender equality in the FAI board is a statement that it wasn't pure. It wasn't showmanship. Mm. It wasn't anything. Now he didn't. He said it's not just that. It's like I think you should leave a board after three, four years. But the chairman, the most the strongest voice on the FAI board for the last while the guy that they put out every time there was a crisis is stepping down because there's not enough females managing the game managing the game in this country that's as strong as it that's top down leadership right there there it is like for all to see you know let's check in with uh, Gaelic Games by the way in, in Porky Cueve because Cork are playing Meath at the moment in uh, Division 2 of the Football League fascinating to see how John Cleary and Colm O'Rourke are going to get on with their counties Paul Carrigan, how's it going there? Uh, very good, John. Yeah, um, we've uh, a game that's kind of after coming into life there the last five minutes or so. Um, Cork on top, um, probably a bit more economical with the recession, and um, have just clicked into gear the last couple of minutes. And um, Matthew Costello responded there with a great point for me. Their first of the game, so it's six points to one one. Um, Stephen Sherlock, couple of early frees, and almost had a goal chance. I think Cork are pressing up on. Could be a goal here for Matty Taylor. Oh yes, oh, great save by Harry Hogan in goal. Matty Taylor's after getting a point himself, but uh, he was set up there by Sean Potter on the run. But as I said, Cork's kick-out press is working quite well. They had a half a goal chance um, through Stephen Sherlock and kicked two points. Um, 
through Maura Shanley and Chris Oak Jones from it. So Cork probably the better team to start. Mead have looked to kick. Um, they're, they got they got an early goal um, from Shane Walsh. He took on Kevin Donovan down the line from a Killian Sullivan kick pass. And Ronan Jones tried uh, a couple more, but they didn't come off. But they are trying to kick pass. Um, it's quite open enough inside. A lot of bodies around the middle. But um, a good game coming to life here with a, with a lot of stake. OK, thanks so much for the moment. Paul Cork, six points, Mead 1-1 at Porky Cueve. Um Speaking of women's sport, you, you were referencing before we went on uh, the tennis uh, and Sabalenka. Yeah, this is a fascinating story. So she's obviously Belarusian. but she's Arena Sabalenka, yes. who won the Australian Open, her first uh, Grand Slam title yesterday. But she obviously had to play as a neutral in inverted commas because of their uh, links with, with Russia and that. And uh, that's one fascinating part of it. But Sabalenka is a fascinating character herself as well. Last year, she had awful trouble with her serve. I think she had something like 450 double faults in, tw- in the 2022 calendar year. She started working with a biomechanics coach, totally broke down her serve uh, and from being an absolute wreck last year who had to serve, had to resort to, uh, resort to serving underarm in Grand Slams, she is now the Australian Open champion and she just, she turned her serve around on its head completely and her serve is now amazingly within, you know, three or four months of working on it is now nearly unbreakable. <laughs> and uh, she also was working with a psychologist and she cut links with the psychologist because she t- reckoned she needed to be her own psychologist. And uh, just a fascinating turnaround. And uh, the neutral link, you know, uh, changing her serve around completely and uh, maybe sorting out her mental game as well. She would have been regarded as maybe somewhat mentally weak in real pressurised situations. And uh, she's turned around and won an Australian Open. And then this morning, Novak Djokovic has won his 10th Australian Open, which is amazing. Joined Rafa Nadal as uh, top of the roll of honour with 22. And uh, he was carrying a hamstring injury throughout the tournament. And he won his straight sets this morning. So there's no stop on him. And at the moment... And the politicians aren't after him over there this time around. So no, like amazing. Run. Like 12 months on. Massive change. You know, 12 months yeah. on. I don't think he's ever been beaten in an Aussie Open final. 10. Like that's nearly as dominant as Rafa is in Paris. Didn't play. his dad, though, cause a bit of controversy during yeah. the last few days by... S- getting his arms around Djokovic fans with Russian flags or whatnot. Well, yeah, yeah, he did, yeah. Uh, I've given the benefit of the doubt that you can't control someone else's actions and you it, can only control your own, but yeah. what he does on the court, he's literally a tennis machine. Yeah, he's, unbe- he's unbeatable, isn't he? Yeah, at it, the moment, yeah. It just shows how life moves on because last year, that story was... Vilified. It was, But it was also the front, the middle and the back pages of everything. Yeah. And it felt like every day we're talking about Novak's yeah. Versus now, where it's just, oh, Thank well, God. you've won 10, you're amazing, you're brilliant, um, you can come back to Australia as many times as you want. Just on Zabalenka as well, she's actually not guaranteed to play at Wimbledon at the moment, unless they change their rules around uh, Russian players and countries with links to Russia being allowed to play in Wimbledon. So, the potentially at the moment, the Australian Open champion... She didn't play in Wimbledon last year and we're not sure yet whether she'll be allowed to play in the All England club this year. Ian O'Reilly had a good column on this in his his column on Saturday in the Irish Times. Uh, Basically the IOC are hinting at getting Russia and Belarus back into the house. His point is the more the IOC insists on welcoming back Russia and Belarus, the more likely it is Ukraine will turn the other way. So that story is going to get really interesting on the lead up to Paris in the next, what is it now, 18 months away. So... Yeah, Wimbledon will be probably the first first battleground for that. And it's going to be, again, it'll come down to, as we talk about, we're talking about Glenn and Kilmer Cole, it'll come, probably come down to the individual players who'll get exposed, you know, and be forced to talk about uh, a war that's got nothing to do with them, you know. Yeah, the Hurley League as well is back next week. I was looking at that, Michael Verney, and uh, interesting to see. Uh, this was just the... Uh the quotes from it uh, in terms of Philip Lanigan's piece and he was going through uh, all the managers Hurling's uh, traditional big three of Kilkenny, Cork and Tipperary all of new managers with Ling, Derek Ling Pat Ryan and Situ along with Liam Cahill almost half of the Division 1 teams then of somebody new at the helm uh, Michal Donoghue Dublin and uh, David Fitzgerald Waterford included they'll bring uh, fresh energy and ideas to the mix so um, the Hurling League probably doesn't have that much attraction given the importance of the Rand Robins coming so quickly after them but just in terms of the people on the sideline, uh, the the characters involved, the almost the movie style aspect to it, the the the, the kind of the twists and turns that could could happen will make it more interesting sometimes almost than the the actual results themselves until we get to the round robins. I don't know if there's ever been a more exciting GA year to be honest with you. You were talking about listening to Paul Kerrigan there, Colin O'Rourke stepping out of the studio uh, and taking for the woolly hat yeah yeah, taking over Mead Kevin McStay Desi Dolan from a hurling point of view then you have Davey obviously took a year out of senior inter-county for the first in 
30 something years I think Michal Dunne who stepped out of the studio as well Pat Ryan in Cork Brian Cody will be you know he will no longer be there. It's going to be weird. Get him into yeah. the studio. Yeah, that's, well, that's, I, I doubt it. He, yeah. he admitted it Joe himself. Canning's about to start being yeah, part Joe's of the Ortiz. Yeah. That'd be good, yeah. Cody admitted before that he wouldn't be half as clever as most of those lads in the studio, even though he's 11 all Ireland's to show for it. But so many interesting narratives on the line. The Hurling League is a funny one because last year, Waterford won the league and two weeks later, they were straight into championship and about three or four weeks after that they were out of championship mm. so the proximity and the squeeze season kind of makes it kind of does diminish the league's importance a bit because uh, those extra games can actually be a negative thing if you go too far and uh, it's probably about blood and players and going deep into your squad and having 24 or 25 ready to come on for those championship games it's so attrition now with that round robin and hurling that you need to have Serious depths uh, of reserves within your squad, so I think that I think that's what Davy will be looking for. Me, Hall Donahue, and Derek Ling, Pat Ryan, all these new faces. But yeah, fascinating, uh, fascinating spring ahead. I just say nothing. A lot of them as well between now and summer. Really, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, still, yeah. it's interesting to try and get it. Even D- word Davy anyway. will say something. He will say something. Yeah, yeah. Say. Uh, Rory McIlroy, 65, 15 under par after round three of the Dubai Desert Classic. He's got a three shot lead over Callum Shinquin and Dan Bradbury. And Evan Ferguson's playing for Brighton. They're goalless with Liverpool. Uh, in the first half of their FA Cup fourth round tie at the Amex Stadium so fascinating stuff we'll plenty to talk about Gavin Komsky and Michael Verney on the Sunday papers after the break between two and three we've got the Six Nations to look forward to plenty of soccer stories as well and uh, don't go away here on Off the Ball on Newstalk Keep up with what's going on at Newstalk FM on Facebook it's the final weekend of the Harvey Norman Big Sale and your last chance to get big deals on home appliances like the Miele Single Oven with automatic programs taking the stress out of cooking. Now 1689. Speed up your cooking time with this Miele Combi Microwave Oven. Now 1879. Buy both products and get a bonus €100 Euro Harvey Norman gift card and get our best prices guaranteed in-store and online. So why shop anywhere else? The Harvey Norman Big Sale must end Monday. Go! Insure My Van.ie Hi, I'm Ken Doherty. For all van drivers and business owners, Insure My Van.ie is Ireland's low-cost van and commercial insurance specialist. For high-quality van and all commercial insurances, call InsureMyVan.ie City Financial Marketing Group Limited, trading as InsureMyVan.ie, is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. The Woody Sale is now on. So if you're planning a DIY home or garden project, you'll find unmissable savings in our one-stop shop. We've got three for two on all interior coloured paint with mix and match across our ranges, up to 30% off home furniture and three for two on all laminate flooring. Shop the way that suits you, in store, online or with click and collect. But hurry, sale ends Sunday. Woodies, we're all homemakers. T's and C's and exclusion supply. Dreaming of the ideal breakaway? Why not start the new year in style with a break at the Sleeve Russell in County Cavan? Discover our 300-acre setting with lakeside walks, cosy fires and affordable luxury. Experience this hidden gem in the hidden heartlands, just 90 minutes from Dublin. To view our special offers and book your break away, visit sleeverussell.ie. This is not about a leap of faith. This is not about a leap into the future. This is about innovative all-electric driving with AOR head-up display, trained parking and over-the-air updates. Here for you today and ready for tomorrow. Because with the all-electric ID range from Volkswagen, Ireland's best-selling all-electric car brand in 2022, tomorrow comes with confidence. Apply for finance online at volkswagen.ie. Volkswagen. Best-selling claim based on most recently published monthly figures. Finance provided by way of higher purchase agreement from Volkswagen Financial Services Ireland Limited. Terms and conditions apply. Volkswagen Financial Services Ireland Limited is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Imagine you're booking a holiday, you go to check your passport and alarm bell. It's out of date. Oh, thank you. The good news? A new passport is just a scroll away. With Passport Online at dfa.ie forward slash passports. Applying online only takes about 10 minutes, so it really is the quick, easy and most cost-effective way. So check your passport is in date today and renew it at dfa.ie forward slash passports. An initiative of the Government of Ireland.
Interested in advancing your career? Trinity College Dublin is now accepting applications for our wide range of professional development, short courses and micro-credential programmes starting soon. As Ireland's leading university, we offer short courses in data analysis, creativity and innovation, business and management, as well as workplace well-being, sustainability and the environment, to name but a few. Whether you're interested in upskilling or reskilling, we have a short course that is right for you. Apply now at tcd.ie for slash courses. Pop an extra spring in your step with this fantastic deal from Air Mobile. Switch today and get the Samsung Galaxy S22 for just €49. Euro. Plus, get unlimited calls, unlimited texts and no limits 5G data on the Air Connect Plus 5G plan. For more, go in store or visit air.ie. 5G coverage subject to availability. Available on selected bill pay plans. 24-month contract subject to fair usage. For full details and terms, see air.ie. Who is the next News Talk Business Person of the Month? Well, that's up to you to decide. Joe Lynham will host a monthly feature on Breakfast Business, which will profile some of the finest business leaders and innovators in Ireland. Each month, the winner will be welcomed on air for an interview and profile of their career to date. Think that they have what it takes? Or maybe you feel you're the one? Then all you have to do is nominate by going to newstalk.com forward slash nominate. The News Talk Business Person of the Month. With Evershed Sutherland, Ireland's most established and largest global law firm. On News Talk. Keep up at News Talk FM on Twitter for breaking news alerts and on demand podcasts. On 106 to 108 FM. On the News Talk app, powered by Go Loud and Smart Speaker. This, this is News Talk. It's two o'clock. Good afternoon. I'm Ellen Butler. Sinn Féin is calling for the cut-off point for young people accessing CAMS to be raised from 18 to 25 to prevent cliff edge. It's one of a number of proposals to reform the mental health service. It'll bring before the doll later this week. Over 13,000 young people were left waiting for psychology treatment in November, according to HSE figures, including almost 1,800 children under the age of five. Sinn Féin spokesperson for mental health, Mark Ward, says the government has neglected its duty to young people. It's years of underinvestment um, by successive governments. It's the recruitment policy within CAMS. Like you have the panel system of recruitment, which is actually cumbersome. So, for example, you could have three occupational therapists in one CHO area, but in the neighbouring CHO area, you, you wouldn't have any. So it's just it just needs to be reformed. TikTok is set to lay off a number of recruitment staff in its Dublin office. The company, which employs around 3,000 people in Ireland, says it will continue to hire across other parts of its business. Last week, both Google and Microsoft announced plans to cut between 5 and 10% of their global workforce by the middle of next year. Aaron Rogan, news correspondent with The Business Post, says further jobs cuts are possible. It will raise questions over whether TikTok will continue to hire in Ireland and, and globally or whether there'll be a slowdown on that or then ultimately whether they may start cutting jobs because with the likes of Facebook and um, Google and even Apple, although they haven't had any major job cuts yet, the first things we noted last summer was that they were letting their recruitment and their retention teams go. The Association of Garda Sergeants and Inspectors is welcoming the introduction of body-worn cameras for Garda by the end of this year. Justice Minister Simon Harris will bring forward legislation next week for the use of body cameras. There were 285 reported incidents of officers suffering injuries during attacks last year, up 42 on the previous year. Antoinette Cunningham, General Secretary of the AGSI, says Ireland is years behind other police forces. We've been talking about body-worn cameras for some time. We're significantly behind other police forces in neighbouring jurisdictions on body-worn cameras. So it really is time uh, that they were introduced for members of Angarda Siakana. And certainly we look forward to their introduction. And finally for now, metal detectors are being used to find a potentially deadly radioactive capsule which is missing in Western Australia. It fell off the back of a lorry on a road trip to Perth. People are being warned not to handle it as it emits the equivalent of 10 x-rays an hour. That's your news update at two minutes past two. News talk weather. Thanks to Ryanair. Cheer on the boys in green with Ryanair's low fares to Rome or Edinburgh. 
Another cloudy but largely dry day. Some bright spells this afternoon, especially in the southeast. Heavier outbreaks of rain can be expected in the north and west later this evening, with top temperatures of 9 to 11 degrees. And now you're up to date on Newstalk. The Sunday Papers on Off the Ball. And welcome back to Off the Ball here on News Talk. John Duggan for your Sunday sitting in for Joe Malloy until seven. We're continuing the Sunday paper review with the GA and horse racing rider with the Irish Independent Michael Verney and the soccer correspondent of the Irish Times, Gavin Comiskey. We'll be back with the lads in a moment, but just to let you know, Harvey Eddie has scored for Liverpool. They lead Brighton 1 0 in the FA Cup fourth round after 33 minutes at the Amex Stadium. Let's get an update from the Allianz National Football League Division 2 match between Cork and Mead at Porky Cueve, Paul Carrigan. Yeah, uh, since we last left you, John, we're 33 minutes on the clock and it's uh, Cork 11 points, uh, Mead 1-6. Uh, yeah, re- Mead really picked it up since we were last speaking to you. Uh, a great point from Killian O'Sullivan and then Michal A. Martin, the Cork keeper, had a double save, uh, cleared one the second one off the line um, from Dara Campion and uh, Jordan Morris. Um, that could have really turn the tide. Um, but uh, the main men really are Stephen Sherlock from, uh, from Cork's point of view. He has eight points, six from freeze, uh, one forty-five, and one from play. He's he's really going well. And on the other side is Shane Welch from Mead. Uh, he's got one four. He's a mark of free, couple from play, and obviously the goal at the start. Um, so they're the two main men really. Lots of bodies around the middle of the field. Uh, both kickouts are generally going long, so there's lots of breaking ball, and a lot of the scores are coming from that. Then, so um, yeah, it's a really tight game. Um, as we see it now, Corker coming through again, and. They're just they've been just held up and we have Brian Hurley who's quite quiet today but it's um it's a, been a really good competitive game so far as I said only two points in it and we're at 34 minutes now so um yeah so that's it from here okay Paul thanks so much for the moment Ross Common five points Tyrone three in Division One and Leitrim ten points Waterford eight latest score in Division Four uh, you can listen to us across the country on your radio and news talk also watch us if you like on the digital and social channels on Periscope uh, YouTube Facebook and on the OTB Sports app we're going to look ahead now to the Six Nations because that's where a lot of the pieces in the papers are today um, because it starts next Saturday as we know we are away to Wales in Cardiff where we haven't won in 10 years Michael Verney Dan Sheehan is interviewed in the Sunday Times today yeah I thought this was a fascinating piece I wouldn't know too much about him now to be honest with you but uh Gav, is this a commonplace thing? He's talking about four years ago and it just says, Peter O'Reilly's right here, he says he was barely a speck in rugby's firmament then, existing anonymously in a non-category all of his own. Yes, he arrived for training every morning in Leinster Academy, but nowhere was he listed as one of its members. He couldn't describe himself as a professional rugby player because he wasn't being paid. Eventually he felt compelled to do something about it, and these are just quotes from Dan. Mum and Dad were like, you have to get a job, how are you going to pay for yourself? So he went into Leinster and asked for a bit of money. I went to the academy manager, Peter Smith, and told him that my folks were hassling me about getting a job because I'm in here all the time. He said, I'll see what I can do. He came back with €500 Euro a month, which I was delighted with. That got me to the end of the season, and then I signed an academy contract. It's funny how it plays out. It's definitely funny how it plays out when you think of where he is four years later. Is that sort of thing common? Uh, I'd say it's not as common as it is as it was then, but what would happen would be he's the... They, for starters, they need extra props and extra hookers all the time, but they had a long list of hookers. But he was, I'm surprised, I just presumed he was on a full academy contract, which again, you have to be kind of in a, uh, your parents have to be kind of in a middle class, upper, cla- upper middle class bracket to, to even survive on whatever they get paid as an academy guy. Yeah. There's the transport issues and everything. So yeah, it's very hard to be from a really properly working class background and survive as a professional rugby player past the point of not of your first big contract because okay. it's so expensive. So it's good that that's out there, but he... Um, yeah, he would have been he he would have been mapped all the time, but for whatever I just from my memory, I know they had just a long list of hookers, uh, and so he was probably just ah he's probably going nowhere because he knows he'll probably break through kind of a thing. It's amazing though, like because you do uh, you need a lad that's just going to dedicate himself, and his parents obviously said that he needed a few quid. I thought this was really interesting as well. I didn't realise that uh, they moved to Bucharest. His dad got a job and. Uh, Basically, he said, there, a Gilbert ball was the boy's connection to Dublin and to the mini rugby they had played uh, in Becht of Rangers. Listen to Sheehan describing the hours that the boys spent together and those freakish line-out stats against Racing 92, which were 25 out of 25 a few weeks ago, begins to make sense. So he just talks about here, we always had a rugby ball everywhere we went. Our street was a cul-de-sac. Uh, so we would do. We would be there lobbing balls all day. I think the hours we spent throwing a ball around in Bucharest or down the beach in Connemara had a bigger impact on my skill set than anything else. You see a lot of kids coming up and they're obsessed with getting big in the gym, but I think you need to be comfortable with the ball in your hands. I think that's um, and that's actually the headline they used there about. Uh, he said the kids were obsessed with getting big in the gym, but you need to be comfortable with the ball. Like isn't that the the kernel of it all? If you have the basic skills 
the other things can probably be developed in yeah. time, you know. Uh, and funny, it's it's himself and Kelleher uh, just all the way now for the rest of their careers. Mm. Just, uh, they'll be the, they could be the two Lions hookers next up, you know. Um, they're that good. Sheehan's been mapped for years, but he's <laughs> he's the opposite of Kelleher. Kelleher's definitely been in the gym, you know. Yeah, yeah. He's brilliant, but a world class hooker, by the way, world class player. But uh, skills wise, Sheehan's the man. I, I I knew he was good, and I knew he was. Um, going to play for Ireland and all that but the way he performed in the summer on the All Blacks trip when he was the number one because Kelleher was injured he was world class he, he was the, he was like almost finished article stuff um, as a technical hooker he, yeah does you, uh, you, you can there's no lessening how effective this guy is he, he is the real this thing this is a Tony Ward Ollie Campbell for hookers thing is it? Yeah, now, <laughs> nobody under forty has a clue what you just what you're talking about there. Yeah, yeah. But they yeah. were they were the two rival outhouse for Ireland in the seven, late seventies, early eighties. I think it's funny though. As no, well, they like, can just share the position. Yeah. They can just share it forever. And it's probably for the best for both of them. Interesting in the, in the article. Take it that Sheehan wants to wear number two hundred and sixteen. He gets on well with Kelleher, almost too well, but shakes his head at suggestions that he's clocking up too many minutes early in a World Cup year. He's serious, but it is up, yeah. with injuries. With all the thing with injuries, you you do need to. If you had two for every position like that, would be would be like France, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think it's a uh, the, the concentration on the skills. I think even I was chatting to Joe Canning the other day. There's a Laker Gale on Thursday night, and he kind of nearly thinks that the GA has gone too much in like what are my running stats or whatever. Like what are my instincts as a hurler? Like what am I what am I seeing in front of me? He'd love to see that maybe developed a bit more. The GA maybe is going. You know, the gym culture is there and it's great but the fundamental skills of the sport still remain and it's good to see... Limerick have bumped. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they do, yeah. yeah. They do, to be fair, and that's the killer from the Chase and Pax point of view. Where do you get at them? You know, uh, skillfully, technically, tactically, physically, they kind of have it all at the moment and that's why they've been so dominant. Lewis Dunk has equalised for Brighton 1-1 against uh, Liverpool in the FA Cup fourth round. I think this is a deflected effort, so might have come Ferguson's off him. in the way there, didn't he kind of block it? We want to claim everything that Brighton do. Yeah, well, that's an Evan Ferguson goal. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, it didn't hit him. Yeah, Sorry. It came off dunk and it went into the kind of wrong-footed Allison and the Liverpool goal. So Liverpool conceding again at the Amex 1-1. It was a Tarek Lamptey shot that uh, kind of came off uh, Duncan. Yeah, set Allison. class positioning from Evan yeah, Ferguson. A bit like... Uh, the Croatia goal in the World Cup deceived Allison just a bit too a bit too far for him. Uh, so one one in that game coming up to half time at the MX Stadium. Uh, loads of writing on the Six Nations. I was fascinated, uh, Gavin Komsky, that in every single uh, prediction with the experts gave, uh, we're, we all went for Ireland to win the championships. So Stuart Barnes, Stephen Jones, Peter Riley, all all went for Ireland. Um, so instead of yeah, build them up to knock them down, probably. But uh, I still think France should win it. See, because it's such a there's a change of coaches that that rugby has a habit of you bring in a fresh voice with enough time and they can like Eras- Erasmus is the perfect example. One year out, win a World Cup with Springboks. There should be a bounce from Gatland, Wales, or from Bortwick, England, um, or or it'll, Welsh rugby seems like they're in tatters off the pitch. They're in awful bother. But I still think France are the best team in the Northern Hemisphere. Ireland are a very close second. And um, Brendan Fanning writes a very interesting piece. He goes, all the other unions are in. You can pick at real problems they have on and off, either on or off the pitch. Well, Ireland are just quietly tipping along, coming off a, se- a series win in uh, New Zealand, beating the Springboks in November and just rolling into this. And it's the opposite of how they were in leading into the 2019, after a 2018 Grand Slam. They were, they just kind of fell apart, as everyone remembers from 2019. So one thing I keep saying every time I watch this team is that, uh, they, they don't, they don't play poorly. They don't have off days. They don't like that first test in New Zealand again. Bren, I think, does write about it here. Um, the first test in New Zealand was an anomaly. Like that, they got. I think they got beaten by five or six tries or whatever. But it was. It, it wasn't a reflection of them. It was. They were disgusted for losing that by so much because it was completely against their whole ethos and the way they perform. They just don't give it to any team easy. So, you could see Ireland winning three matches and losing two by. In really really tight ones this year although they have France and England at home so yes. it is set up for the Grand Slam but you can see them losing one or two games Wales away or France at home and still be flying into the World Cup confidence wise and everything because they just don't play poorly there's something about them now again we're talking about uh, the future of hookers how healthy it is again it goes back to, Ireland could end up in the same place as every other World Cup if tight head and out half get injured it's yeah. still there there still is no tight furlong coming in next I think Keane Healy's been playing tight head at the moment they're covering for it and as well I have a lot of time for Crowley I think they should give him his spurs during, actually he should definitely start a game in the Six Nations but it looks like Ross Byrne's going to probably be ahead of him I think but, but that's the only 
flow. How much stock do you place in the Six Nations this year of all years? As long as it's as long as you don't kind of flunk it, shall we say, as long as you're consistent and things like that. But how much stock do you place in it? Is it important to win it? Yeah, it's massive. Just just ignore the World Cup and try and win the Six Nations because it's a it's first of all it's the cash cow. When you're going into a Six Nations week, you're a player or a coach, the World Cup is irrelevant. You yeah. don't think about it because they are massive games and it's. It's huge, and it it does dictate your form and your mood in camp. How you perform, they'll the IRFU have always pushed have rated the Six Nations higher than the World Cups because one of them loses the money and one of them makes the money. Yeah. What about the the public? Don't kind of see it like that, shall we say? The big thing is like getting over that quarter final hump. If we win a Grand Slam this year and we're still beating in the World Cup quarter final, is that? I think that's likely. Because yeah. the air, the also, I, I think the best thing that's happened to them is the air's gone out of this World Cup because of the draw. It's yeah. you're playing New Zealand or France if you if again if you get through Samoa or Tonga, South Africa and Scotland, and Tonga are going to be a very good team. They're going to have Izzy Falau and all these kind of ex All Blacks and ex Wallabies in their team. So to get past the quarter final now is as good an achievement as can ever happen in Irish sport. So. Don't worry about it. Just just get there and be competitive. Just do what you do. And this is the thing about this Irish team. They don't dip. They really don't dip under Andy Farrell now that he's got them firing, you know. So, yeah, it's all, it's all pretty good. Brendan Fanning, though, does touch on and uh, against uh, Stephen Jones in the front of the Sunday Times, leads with this. Uh, well, CEO, as you said there, Steve Phillips has resigned. Um, Brendan Fanning writes in the third paragraph of his kind of Six Nations scene setter he goes this is what he means by every other country is in a bad way he goes in a documentary broadcast last week the former manager of Welsh women's rugby alleged a male colleague had bragged to office workers that he wanted to take her back to a hotel and rape her another female member of staff said she had considered suicide so toxic was the work atmosphere Scotland got rid of a guy, have sacked a player who was pleaded guilty to domestic abuse Bernard Laporte was arrested for a second charge last week and um, England, I don't know. I don't know what's going on there, but um, I, I don't think, I think they might have made a mistake by giving the Wallabies Eddie Jones and putting Steve Bortwick in charge. Time will tell. But his point, his overall point is everyone else seems to be in a bad way and we're um, trucking along. He did, though, again, going back to the difference between how the women's side of the house and the men's side of the house are treated, he does make a reference to Railway Union's director of rugby, John Cronin, who's well worth your follow on Twitter for... He, again, um, much like Nadine Doherty's article, he just points out, look, this is what's happening in men's rugby. It's been really well run on the professional end, and this is what's happening at, on the domestic side of women's rugby. And what, and what he means by is very little is happening. And, um, yeah, so it's good that he actually did dip back into that. Yeah, Nigel Walker, the new CEO of Wales... Uh that's announced today and uh, these are his comments there's no doubt that Welsh rugby is facing an existential crisis this has been a wake-up call perhaps a call that's been overdue the first step to any recovery is admitting the problem we must now listen intently to what people are from outside our organisation are telling us we care and committed to quality diversity inclusion we'll work hard in this space with dedicated resources and investment we need to do better we need to do much better and we will uh, so the ORF or Welsh rugby Union said no allegations were made against Phillips, Steve Phillips in that documentary and he's not accused of any wrongdoing but it presume he presided over the culture and this is a culture thing um, and obviously these things are unacceptable so we'll wait and see what happens there um, yeah Tommy Conlon kind of going on your point Gavin uh, it's negligent of the game in this country as in other countries to continually obsess about the big show the World Cup and the annual show still has so much to offer in terms of brilliance and drama on the pitch and social enjoyment and international bonhomie off it it might be ancient in origin and relatively provincial in global terms but the Six Nations has evolved into a tremendous annual exhibition of elite sport with all the glamour and prestige befitting its stature as a major league tournament in the Sunday Independent. It's the only way to go. You, if, you, if you switch, it's just been proven time and again, if you don't nail down your Six Nations in a World Cup year, you are going to struggle. You know, um, I think England have pulled it out of the fire a couple of times when they, they're probably a, a, a good, because they've got so much depth, they're probably a good squad to have at a World Cup. The bigger the, the, bigger the numbers, the more chances you have of being able to replace a Tig Furlong or a Sexton if they go down. But Ireland have come up with a plan that's slightly different from what they've done for other World Cups. You saw that they've they've nailed they've lined out lads like Jamie Osborne to come through by these little tours that have hurt the provinces and stuff. Um, I suppose Brent did talk. He didn't go into detail about Bundy Aki, which could be conceived as a bit of a problem. Maybe not in Ireland, but he's been out out in the cold in Connacht. He hasn't played any rugby. Um, I imagine he's the starting twelve because Robbie Henshaw's still injured. Even though Osborne's come through, and McCluskey's McCluskey, a good player. Yeah. Osborne's going to be going to be great but I think Bundy is still the number one he's done so much for Ireland but uh, Andy Friend 
again, I was saying to you off air, there's not, probably not so different from Santos knowing that it was his last few months in the job. So that I, I'm not going to get to a certain level with Ronaldo and the team or captain of my team, just drop them. It looks like, again, I, I don't know because it's, there's been, it's all, we're in a world of conjecture here with Bundiaki because there has to be something wrong if your best player ever to play for your province, still in the prime of his career, is not getting picked on the It might be the, the case bench. that, you know, he could be on the road to a move. Okay, but you get it out there because again we're guessing now. Yeah, that was yeah, I heard yeah. Rory O'Connor talking about some some kind of an attitude, uh, yeah, atmosphere. which we don't again, know. Again, we don't know. It's just like it's source based. <laughs> I noticed the local reporters didn't ask when they had Andy friend or they had the Connacht lads up for media last week. Um, it should be a bigger story than it is that uh, the the almost I'd say he's pretty nailed on starting twelve for Ireland. Can't get it. He doesn't have an injury. Doesn't have an injury and can't get on the bench for his club. Mm. What's From going an on? Irish point of view, uh, in a World Cup year, as we say as well, like how much rugby is he going to play? He'll play five games in the Six Nations, he'll play a bunch of warm up matches, and they're ready to go. But I'm sure they'll have to fix it up, you yeah. know. But then again, yeah, I, I, I don't any know. friends picking a good young lad of 12 from yeah, that they brought, brought from the I don't academy? I think he's going to pick Aki. Like, uh, you know, he could pick Osborne or McCluskey, uh, maybe a bit on the basis of the fact they've been playing games. Yeah. We'll keep talking about this. This will be go. This will go longer than Croke's Glen. I bet, I bet Nothing you. will go longer than Croke's Glen. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing will go longer. They have the nipping in the bud though, because uh, you bring him into the Six Nations, and if he's outstanding, which I think he will be, I think he'll, I think he'll just come in. Now maybe, maybe not. Maybe Jamie Osborne will pass him out when he gets into camp. We'll see. But um, strange one, isn't it? That it's just still lingering in the wind there. That we haven't got an idea of what. What the story is. Uh, 5 3 6 Warren Gatland wasn't that successful on his return to New Zealand club rugby and the last Lions tour was a disaster under him. After three years away from Welsh rugby, it's unlikely he'll turn around their recent fortunes. And another one, so glad Djokovic won, it's a big middle finger to the woke leftist media, Australian government, etc., who all irrationally portrayed him as this horrible person just because he made a choice not to get vaxxed. That's one of our textures on 53106. His body, his choice. Uh, Neil Francis uh, writing about Gibson Park, not Sexton's Ireland's key man. Farrell would not swap his speedy scrum half even for DuPont. So the foundation stone is a scrum half who is an unquantifiable gift for lubricating the passage of play from breakdown to ball in hand without ever seeming to take anything out of the ball. It's like the rec- great referees. You barely know that they're there. Ireland can only play high tempo properly when Gibson Park's on the field. It's the highest compliment that anybody could pay Andy Farrell. He knew what he wanted to do and his blueprint for the brand of rugby he wanted and he also knew that the Kiwi was a little bit off and yet he still picked him and his return on his investment has been paid back in spades. We had Brian O'Driscoll on the show yesterday on the panel just talking about the four players that are very replaceable. Uh, Sexton, uh, he said Andrew Porter, Doris and Gibson Park. Um, uh, Doris is the, one of the best players Ireland have but he is replaceable. Jack Conan could play there. Um, the... Uh, Tyke Furlong is another one. Just the next guy up is this. That's, I suppose that's more what he meant. If I don't want to say the word irreplaceable, because that's yeah. my word. Uh, Porter, uh, yeah, it's, this this is tough in the RFU because they've done serious, serious work in the last few years, in the last de- decade. But <laughs> we could have had this conversation 15 years ago. If you lose the tight head and the out half for this Ireland team, it's a different Ireland team. And our, sorry, the scrum half too. Like it looks like Craig Casey's next. If you bring in Conor Murray to play this game, it's a different game, Arden play. Automatically different game because of speed and pace. If, if Conor Murray's the starting scrum half over Jameson Gibson Park. Craig Casey's a version of Jameson Gibson Park. He's just, just not as quick, not as rapid. So, yeah, there's, there's, I think there's, there's both props. But it's grown half and out half. And again, I definitely could have had this conversation for the last two World Cups, last three World Cups conceivably, that um, there's, there's, there's flaws that if you can get out of Ireland. But if not, if they all go well, uh, Doris is great, but um, Max Deegan's there as well. You know, there's a bunch of guys who can come in and play that position. Just not the, Doris is just probably just Ireland's best player. That's the best way to describe him. Anything else from your end, from a rugby point of view? Michael? No, Sam War- Warburton was in the Times as well. I thought it was interesting. He's talking about uh, you can keep your flashy fly halves, give me the teak tough leadership of uh, Dan Bigger, Owen Farrell, and Sexton any day. A trio that deserve uh, greater respect. We'll miss them when they're gone. Um, how would you manage Johnny during the Six Nations? How uh, would you manage him this season going into the World Cup? Or are you, so you can't, forgetting about the World Cup? For yeah, you can't, you can't manage him. Just You have to let him keep playing. He wants to have rhythm as well. He wants to have a good, really good season. He's going to get injured. It's guaranteed. Yeah. It's guaranteed every season for the last few years. So maybe he just that injury just happened and he's back from the cheekbone. Um, it always seems to be about a week or two before the, the, the Six Nations. It's announced <laughs> Johnny Sexton is fit <laughs> and he comes back, you know. So just play him. I don't Crowley has to start a Six Nations game. Again, I said this about Carberry four years ago. Um, he has to come in. Crowley has to be given his head as you're the guy next up. 
if it goes to the thing because Ross Byrne won't win us uh, with all respect from him he's definitely earned his place to, as a recall I've been playing better than Joey Carberry but he won't win us he won't get us to a World Cup he won't get on to a World Cup semi-final or final you know just um, but the other thing is guaranteed is Carberry and Sexton just our injury profile tells us that they're not going to make it from here to there so you're you're hoping for a bit of luck you know you can't manage Sexton. Yeah, you, you know he he is the he is the coach on the pitch. He runs so much of the the game. You have to I'd imagine him. you're trying to pull him back like that as well, anyway, because he just wants to go. Yeah, see, and the problem is you have to start him, but also you nearly have to finish him <laughs> because if any tight yeah. game, he's key. You see the dip when the other right half comes on. It's remarkable that he's still going. Him and LeBron James are just flying, like, <laughs> both of them pushing forward. You know, yeah, yeah. yeah. A halftime Ross common eight points. Tyrone five in Division One of the Allianz Football League. Kerry got a goal. Darren Moynihan. The All Ireland Champions lead Donegal one four to three points up in Bally Buffet. We've Ashley O'Reilly up there, so she brings us the latest. It is one all at half time between Liverpool and Brighton in the FA Cup, with uh, Lewis Dunk equalising Harvey Elliott's opener. Stoke one, Stevenage nil is another score. That is the latest score. Wrexham play Sheffield United at half four. Uh, we also have to finish off the rugby. The King of Cool, France are a reflection of their suave leader, making them hard to beat. Right, Sue Farrelly talking about. Rugby's top 20 all-time cool dudes uh, are the top Irish one Tony Ward in the 1970s with glam rock and flowing locks at the height of their popularity Tony Ward burst onto the scene with a John Travolta glamour and a brand of rock and roll rugby that made him an instant hit Ward's appeal extended beyond rugby's cosseted cosy environs and his exciting style won over the masses ultimately Ward became too big for the IRFU to handle he was sensationally dropped on the 1979 tour to Australia but there are plenty of men and women who recall the time when AJP Ward was king and everybody wanted a piece of him you're Ali Campbell comparison yeah, is well, alive and well. It is alive and well. I think Tony <laughs> Ward was the first Irish sports star to do adverts, if I remember right. Oh, yeah. Not that I, well, I remember reading about it because I wasn't uh, old enough. Unbelievably good football player as well. Yeah, and won an FAI Cup, I believe, with Limerick. Yeah. Uh, Tony O'Reilly was number 13. He was the second one on the list. Uh, we also have Simon Zebo and uh, Mike Gibson, the other players making the top 20. So. No Gavin Henson, no? Uh, well, I was oh, Hugh Farley notoriously doesn't like Gavin Hens. Yeah. Yeah, Hugh yeah. Farley, it, it, excuse to go to the news agents and buy yourself a, a Sunday a mail on Sunday. It, his cool, his cool feature. Well, you know, <laughs> it's actually pretty funny to be honest. I've, n- I've no idea. I've no Plus idea. Got in there, yeah. I've no, yeah. Idea, I've no idea. But that, uh, that, that opinion. But um, so we're going to take a break. We're going to be back with soccer uh, after the break, and also some horse racing on the Sunday papers. It's Gavin Comiskey from the Irish Times and Michael Verney from the Irish Independent. After this. The Sunday Papers on Off The Ball. Moncrief. Uh, though somebody else is less pleased uh, with that item, they say this show is obsessed with poop. It should be called Mon Crap or Poop FM or Feces Fest or something. You are listening to the Mon Crap Show on Poop FM. You're all very welcome. Moncrief. Brought to you by Avant Money. Weekdays at 2pm on News Talk. This year, we're all feeling the pinch. So at Tesco, we want you to spend less with us. Take the cost out of takeout with two Tesco finest pizzas and two extras for only €12.50 with club card prices. Tesco, because right now, every little helps. Offer valid until February 21st. See in store or on tesco.e for details. Available in majority of larger stores. Club card or Tesco app required. This year, Skoda's all over the country will take thousands of new babies home from the hospital. Brides to be to their weddings camogie champions on a lap of victory around their local village. Excited new family dogs home from the rescue centre. Proud parents to their firstborn's graduation. There's so much to look forward to. Here's to brighter days ahead. Skoda. Made for Ireland. Insure my van.ie. Hi, I'm Ken Doherty. For all van drivers and business owners, insuremyvan.ie is Ireland's low cost van and commercial insurance specialist. For high quality van and all commercial insurances, call insuremyvan.ie. City Financial Marketing Group Limited, trading as insuremyvan.ie, is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. We're sorry to inform you of yet another delay. No, not the train this time, it's John. He's delayed getting his eyes tested. If he's accidentally sat in your lap, knocked over your suitcase or kissed you instead of his wife, we can only apologise. John has now been informed that eye tests and glasses from the 69 euro range at Specsavers are free with PRSI or medical card. So there's no need to delay booking an appointment. Find out more at specsavers.ie. John, can you get off my lap? Imagine you're booking a holiday, you go to check your passport and alarm bells. It's out of date. 
thank you. The good news? A new passport is just a scroll away with Passport Online at dfa.ie forward slash passports. Applying online only takes about 10 minutes, so it really is the quick, easy and most cost-effective way. So check your passport is in date today and renew it at dfa.ie forward slash passports. An initiative of the Government of Ireland. It's the final weekend of the Harvey Norman Big Sale with deals across our massive range of technology like the Huawei MateBook D16 laptop with an Intel Core i5 processor and a stunning 16-inch screen that filters out blue light and displays vibrant colours only 979 or get the stylish Huawei FreeBuds Pro 2 noise-cancelling earbuds for an ultimate listening experience only 179 Get our best prices guaranteed in-store and online so why shop anywhere else? The Harvey Norman Big Sale must end Monday Don't miss out! Go! The Sunday Papers on Off The Ball. And you're welcome back to Off The Ball for your Sunday afternoon. John Duggan sitting in for Joe Malloy. Let's get an update from the Gaelic Games. Allianz Football League Division 2 opening round for Cork and Meath and a Porky Cueve. What's the latest? Paul Kerrigan. Yeah, um, I suppose since we left you, Cork were two points up at half time, but uh, Meath have got the first two scores of the second half. Start really brightly, so it's 1-8 to 11. Um, again, that man Shane Walsh, a long free came in. He won possession, was fouled. They just can't really handle him at the moment. And then... Um, Again, a great kick to uh, a great uh, score two minutes later from Jordan Morris. Again, that kick passing, which was really prevalent towards the end of the second half. Mead keep trying it. Uh, it didn't come off a bit in the first half, but it definitely came off at the start of the second half. And a great kick pass from Dolan Kyogen into Jordan Morris. Took his man on and put it over. Definitely a lot more aggression as well from the Mead backs in the second half. They, they're really pushing up in the, the car forwards, and Cork haven't got into it at all. Um, turned over plenty of forward, uh, ball in their forward um, unit. So Mead started brighter in the second half and a uh, draw game here after. Uh, 42 minutes uh, 1 8 to 11 points OK Paul thanks so much for the moment let's go up to Batty Buffet and it's uh, Donegal against Kerry Ashley and O'Reilly Yes John 29 minutes gone here Donegal 4 points Kerry 1 6 it's been quite a slow start to the game some early wides from both teams Dara Roach got the first score of the game for Kerry that was with 7 minutes gone the tempo of the game it picked up after that with Donegal getting 2 scores in a row from Darrow Boyle and Caelan McGonagall who's making his league debut today um, but the big moment so far was 16 minutes gone Donegal fullback Brendan McCoy he was dispossessed by Dara Moynan and the goalkeeper was off his line and Moynihan put it into the back of an empty net so all the, the Kerry scores so far are coming from Donegal being t- overturned time and time again at the moment it's Donegal 4 points Kerry 1-6 and, and Ashley I'm say that to you John it's now oh, wide sorry a wide there again for Donegal so it's still Donegal 4 points Kerry 1-6 and Ashley new bit of news on this uh, Jim McGuinness will be doing a bit of work with Dan we believe yes John uh, so it is true that Jim McGuinness has joined County Down on a consultancy basis so it's known that he'll be in for one day a week at the moment. Um, he joined there last week. He took a training session in Park Esler on Tuesday night. And that was the first time he was in with the team. And it's known now that going forward, it's a consultancy role. And it's about one day a week at the moment. But I suppose who knows when it gets into championship times, things might be changed. OK, Ashley, we'll, uh, we'll leave you there for the moment. Obviously, it's uh, noisy up in Valley Buffet. Sligo, three points. Cork, 1-4. Leitrim, 2-13. Waterford, nine points in Division 4. Also, scores coming in from elsewhere. Uh, Clare, two points. Louds, four in Division 2. Uh, interesting news about Jim McGuinness. Yeah, fascinating, yeah. Uh, he'd obviously be... I think he's still involved with the with the Derry City under-17s, but uh, he was with the Waterford Hurlers at different stages last year, dip, kind of dipping in and out. Uh, he's obviously involved with Down now. I think he has a bit of a link with Conor Laverty before. Uh, Conor Laverty seems to have a lot of pulling power in down. He had Sean Boylan up with him when he was under... This sounds like consultancy manager. work from a Jim McGuinness. I'll go in yeah, there. It's not uh, the end of his soccer manager. No, oh, I wouldn't think career. so, no. I think he's, like, he still seems pretty adamant that that's the direction he wants to go in, but surely like, like, the Sky deal is gone now, so he's probably not keeping his finger on the pulse of Gaelic football maybe as much. I'm sure maybe. BBC won't too. Yeah, or RT <laughs> possibly might come do, yeah. yeah. But... Uh, it would be a good way to keep your finger on he's the one of the best. He he's go, he's, he's go one of the best it, you know? analysts out there. Mm. Um, uh, William Mullins, 4,000 winners yesterday. Unbelievable, yeah. 4,000 4, winners worldwide. Uh, it's a good piece, actually, with his brother Tom, with Don McLean in the Times. Uh, Tom is you know, operating at a completely different level than, than Willie is, but he's a lovely horse. Facile mode won over the Christmas with his uh, with his son Charlie aboard. But there's some good uh, some good quotes from Willie yesterday. I've interviewed Willie several times as if you have John and like he will never big himself up in in any way at all. And he always deflects to I suppose the people that help help kind of 
get him where he is now, but he just says, everything I learned, I learned from my dad, who's obviously Paddy Mullins, the great trainer, including patience, which I didn't know I was learning and didn't want to learn when I was younger, uh, as is the way uh, it is when you were younger. You don't realise the things you are learning uh, as you were just doing day-to-day stuff until you come across these problems and instances in your life that you think back and go, oh, he would have done this or uh, he would have done that. Then things become simpler and clearer and you realise why he did those things. Uh, he was just hugely experienced, just in reference to his dad. 4,000 worldwide winners. Um, like He could keep training for another... 20 years realistically interestingly Patrick his son is, is quoted uh, at the end and by all accounts like Patrick is one of the shrewdest uh, in the equine game and is like the heir apparent to the throne when that will happen or not uh, we don't know but he just said um, he's talking about when Giganstown cut ties with him uh, when Michael O'Leary cut ties with him in 2016 like most uh most people or most trainers would have downsized or that would have had a you know detrimental effect on him instead he just went and he went after all sorts of different owners. There's so many different colours in his yard now. And Patrick just said he could have uh, very easily downsized, but he didn't. He upscaled. And we've more horses now than before Giganstown left. That is the sign of his ambition. One day I'll take over, I'm sure. But I'm in no rush, and I don't think he's in any rush either. I think he'll train for a long time yet, and that suits me. Uh, I'm not in any rush. I'm just thinking about dynasties, sp- Irish sport and dynasties. You think of... Um, like the Mullins family is unbelievable. If Paddy Mullins, who uh, unfortunately passed away a few years back, his wife uh, Maureen is still going to the races now. I think she's 94. She goes to Cheltenham every year. The sons are, you know, Willie, uh, Willie, Tom, George, and Tony. Tony actually sends Princess Zoe over hurdles tomorrow. A great a Group One win in mare. Tom is a smaller trainer than Willie, but is you know still well established on the map of Cheltenham winners. Willie will go down as probably the greatest trainer. Uh, greatest national hunt trainer of all time. Then you have the sons, jockeys. David is a grand national winning jockey, now retired. Danny is a you know, grew a grade one winning jockey, one of the best in the game. Patrick is a fourteen time amateur, I think. Charlie's on the way up now. Tom's son, like it's, it's some <laughs> strong dynasty. argument. Yeah, it's some dynasty. I'm gonna have to write this feature again. <laughs> You're gonna have to give it another spin. I'm telling you now. Uh, just like four thousand winners worldwide and. Like, what could he end up on if he stays going yeah. the way he is? Well, probably the O'Briens will be rivaling them in a way. From the flat point of view, you've got obviously Aidan, you've got Joseph, you've got Dunica. Yeah, what, what Joseph is achieving already at his age is probably surpassed what Aidan achieved at that age over both jumps and flat. Yeah, no, he's unbelievable. I yeah, met him yeah. a few years ago. He's an impressive young fella. He's an impressive yeah. fella, yeah. Uh, stylish as well, very stylish yeah. fella. And he actually is operating out of the yard that his mother was champion trainer from and his dad trained from uh, originally as well. Just beside, you mentioned Pilton. I was going to say Pilton. Yeah, yeah, Owning Hill is up the top and you can yeah. see the village from yeah. there. Yeah, uh, That's a fair battle between the two of them. I'd love to even see across great other... football pitches yeah. there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Across other sports. Listeners the out there, dynasties? 5 3 one, oh, six, the great sporting dynasties in Ireland. I can think of the Spillans maybe in, in Gaelic yeah. football as one I can think of, but uh, off the top of my head. I'm sure there's some in Gaelic games, but uh, I can't think of many more, Gavin. Even uh, Willie's brother, George, is not directly involved in uh, racing, shall we say, training horses, but he does all the training transport for basically everybody and then his son Emmett is a Grand National winning trainer um, it's just yeah no, endless it's, really it's mad uh, Brighton won Liverpool won in the second half now Stoke won Stephen and Schnell in the FA Cup uh, we're into kind of um, uh, why do sports journalists say facile when they mean easy I think we're talking about the horse there uh, facile mode yeah. facile mode is the name of the horse so look it's uh, you, can, you can give us a pass on that one um Gavin Cummins, there's not much real good soccer riding I felt today in the papers, to be honest. We're in match report territory. I didn't feel there was that much that was great. Did you spot anything? Um, no, I just, there was a quote. Um, I don't know if it made the Sunday Independent, but it was up on the uh, Independent website. Uh, it was just Aaron Connolly bagged two goals for Hull City. He's on loan there. And if anyone ever needed to bag a couple of goals on a loan move, it was Aaron Connolly who had a really, really just... It was such a shame. He went back in. He showed that he's kind of buried his ego a bit by going back into the under twenty one squad, and he was pretty effective in their defeated playoffs. But he went to Venezia in Serie B, and it just didn't happen for him. It didn't come together, and he was kind of running out of lives as a footballer. And he's still only just turned twenty three. Um, it looks like his Brighton career is, is not going to get reignited. So he went to Hull. Liam uh, Rose Rosemore, I think his name is, um, who's known him since he was a kid. So might have yeah yeah, and he said. It was really just a really interesting quote about him after he bagged two goals in a, in an important game and the second goal, a lovely touch and then finish. 
Um, he goes, uh, Aaron's an emotional, is emotional at times. And when he first came to the club, he was on his best behaviour. Uh, but I didn't want that. I wanted him to be himself. He's a natural. Um, he is a natural, there's no doubt about that, but you can interpret emotional in so many ways and he told him to be himself. I don't think his pa, his the younger version of him being himself has worked very well as a professional footballer. So it's great that he's got a manager who's backing him like this. If, if ever he needed someone to back him and he's banged in two goals, because we're in, we're in a conversation now where... I think it's nailed on. Evan Ferguson's going to start uh, in against starting Ed. again today for Brighton. Yeah, he, he, against he's a Premier League striker. He's proven. It. I know he's eighteen, but it, it means that uh, at the kickstart it'll give to people like Aaron Connolly, Adam Ida, Troy Paris, and Michael Obafemi now, who's on his way to the Premier League with Burnley. If all goes well, and he's just been it's, it's a loan deal, but I think he'll get extended because they've wanted him for a while. So all of a sudden, when we go from Evan Ferguson down, <laughs> our striking options, it all just, with Nathan Collins at the back, it all just has a different look to it, you know what I mean? Leading into a, a massive year, an admission impossible year to qualify for the Euros straight in, from the Netherlands and France. But um, from Aaron, Con- Aaron Connolly scoring goals again, is like he's the, he'd be the bottom of the tree when it comes to picking strikers. Like he won't, I, I'd be surprised if he made it into the senior squad in March. But... Um, yeah, we've got Evan Ferguson in the background here playing against Liverpool. So Yes, 1-1 one, one after 50 minutes of that game in uh, Demick Stadium. I think it says that David Delaney was on the show here on Football Saturday yesterday talking about like you've got to be you've got to be like almost like you ha- almost have to be in the army. Now, he didn't say that, but that was kind of the, the general gist that you have to be an utterly dedicated pro. You've got to give this everything because it's such an elite level now of the global game, which the, the global league, the European Super League is the Premier League. But also, on the other hand, these people are not robots. And if there's a way of managing them that can get them to their best, but also understanding that they have a bit of life to them. And can we get that life onto the pitch, but also keep their discipline? It's they've a so much time, balancing act. They have so much time in their hands, yeah. though, John. So it's vital who you have around you. Yeah, sport uh, network. If you're addicted, to, you, addic- be addicted to video games. Don't be addicted to gambling. You know, because uh, you have all that, all the days in the world, and all the money you could spend as a young fella. So the army thing sounds about right for guys who make it. You know, they're super disciplined. And did he? I think. I, I think. Oh yeah, I was listening to it yesterday. He mentioned like Jack Grealish goes for it once a month. Or a couple of weeks a year. It and just seems the like the rest Jack, of the time he's a monk. Yeah, yeah, you know? it was like the rocks cheat day. His yeah. famous cheat day. Yeah. <laughs> it just seems with Jack Reader's study, you know, you know, from um, you know, the coverage in the press that he has gone for it, but people then just oh you're the, just a jack lad, but obviously he wouldn't be if you don't make it as a session. Gra- Guardiola would not have near his place no. without without him being a dedicated pro. No, you have to be an athlete on, on the same level as individual athletes who go to the Olympics to play Premier League football now. No, well, probably even more so. It's it does feel like a military kind of exercise now getting through day to day and session to session and again Damien said it's a pretty boring life you know um, all that money helps for your future but you, know, you can go build something else with your life a more normal life but it's it's very regimented the GPS stats don't tell lies yeah. they really don't Obafemi's like uh not his commitment per se, but like his uh, commitment well, to recovery was kind of uh, questioned by his previous manager in Southampton, I think, wasn't it? Does, well, it was Southampton. He's had a couple of issues with a couple of managers, including Swansea, when he was dropped last year. Um, and he, it, what he did against Scotland last summer was so so encouraging and so great, so potentially great for Ireland that uh, I hope he finds a bit of a, a stream of form here between now and March and could play off. Ferguson, arguably, um, he's certainly. I, I always thought Obafemi was just a selfish striker, but he, he loves to bring other players into the game. That's what we've seen that when he's coming to Ireland. But yeah, his reputation hasn't been great. But again, like same with Aaron Connolly, they're young fellas. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like yeah. They're, they're, a tiny mistake is 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 all over the papers. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, just don't date someone who's in love on Love Island. Is the kind of is the lesson really? It's funny when you listen to Roy Keane talking about in his younger days, like did. Like regular kind of blowouts and things like that, but, and, yeah, and he got savage in the he got savage in the media for uh, being a young fellow who had a few pints on, right, when he comes yeah. into Ireland camp. He got kicked around fairly heavily, and he hasn't forgotten who did that and who said that about him. But yeah, even then, you could hide it way more. Um, like, yeah, the funny, the famous one is like how Giggs. No one knew what Ryan Giggs' personality was until the end of his career. You know, it's mm-hmm. the same. But so yeah, you can you can do certain things, but it, yeah, it. I think Damien's right. It does seem like. Uh, again, D- uh, David Snyder was over at, for the 42 and he wrote a column about it today so it kind of relates to the Sunday papers. He went spent a weekend last week over in the uh, southwest of England and he focused and he did get interviews with Nathan Collins and with Stephen Kenny and with uh, Joe Hodge's dad and John O'Shea but he focused on the guys we don't know about. It's a very good feature. It's worth reading um, about how difficult and how demanding a life is and to survive for 10 years uh, 
it's it takes some character, you know, because mm. it's very unforgiving. And the, the beauty of it is, if you do survive for ten years, you've got enough money to kind of build a, a new career or a new life for yourself over the next fifty years. So that's the challenge. But a nineteen-year-old doesn't think like that. No. You know? It sounds like Connolly has someone, a manager that understands him. God, which helps. Uh, but it's early days. I think it's yeah. early days. Yeah, it is always early days. Especially yeah. when he scores, I always get worried. Yeah, like, what's yes. going to happen now? Because he scored for, against, for Spurs in his debut. But Kenny and Keith Andrews really did take care of him as best they could. And they sat him down. And unfortunately, this is the legacy that's going to follow Aaron Connolly's career until he does something to amend it. They did show him how he, he wasn't, how he ran as an under, when he was initially an under 21 footballer for Ireland. And then they showed him as he ran against Azerbaijan in that game two years ago. And it was just a completely different player. And if you're playing up top in any team now, and if you're not, a, if you're not like an absolute running machine, you're, you're not at the race. And he is. So he just has to rediscover it. So I was delighted to see him score two goals. Philip Quinn riding uh, Tom O'Connor and Wrexham IOP FA Cup giant killing. That's the third game today against Sheffield United at half four. This has the look of a Hollywood blockbuster. Tom O'Connor, one of those slow burners, he's an Irish underage international who set aside his hurl and slitter in Kilkenny while playing for uh, Toloka Rosperkan. Is that the way you pronounce it? Uh, Toloka Rosperkan, yeah. yeah, yeah the home yeah. of Walter Walsh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on the Kilkenny side of New Ross and pitched up at Southampton at 17 and is now playing for Wrexham. So we'll have a a giant killing against Sheffield United today I suppose the one thing just because you don't play for the Republic of Ireland doesn't mean they're not Irish players playing across the water that are making a good living and also making it as hard as it is to make it in any league over there for sure yeah anything else that we have Michael uh, we speak about Tom Mullins there yeah, and, and yeah, there was a piece on him yeah just uh, I was mentioned kind of about Willie earlier he, Tom had a big winner over Christmas in a bumper at Leopardstown yeah. it was just fascinating to yeah uh, Don got Don McLean got some great detail off him in the Times here. So he just said the original plan for Facile Mode was to run in the bumper on the first day of a Leprosome Christmas Festival. But then Tom and Helen's son Charlie, the horse's intended rider, injured his ankle playing indoor soccer. Uh, and they decided to wait and go for the winner's race, which was a much difficult, more difficult race on the last day of the Leprosome Christmas Festival. That was the 29th. Um, and he was a really, really dominant winner in a really, really good race. Um, and there's been lots of good kind of stories, I'd say, in the last year or so. Uh, if you look at John Shark Hannon with Hewick, um, would be one great example of guys that have, you know, either bred horses themselves or bought them for, you know, small enough money. I think Hewick was 850 quid, went over and won the American Grand National. He's gotten a load of horses into his yard as a result of that. While the big hitters and the, you know, the horses that cost three or four hundred thousand at Tattersalls or the Cheltenham Sale or whatever, they are still, you know, that's the majority. There is still a place uh, for the minority. And I think the Shark has gotten a load of new owners on the back of that American success. He's a really interesting one running the Grand National actually in a couple of months. So, uh, he had, got, had American owners on to him after Hewick won and their great-grandfather won the Grand National in 1923 and they wanted a horse to run in the 2023 renewal and have a box taken on the line. So Shark has purchased Cape Gentleman off Emmett Mullins from them and he will hopefully run in the entry Grand National uh, and they'll be trying to win the Grand National 100 years after their great-grandfather did. But that's, uh, there's lo lots of great kind of racing stories like that that probably go against the grain and show that it's still possible for the small man to thrive even though Willie Mullins and Gordon Elliott and probably Henry de Bromhead to a lesser extent are still dominating of sorts. The 1923 Grand National was won, as uh, Wikipedia tells me, Sergeant by Sergeant Murphy, Murphy yeah. a 13 year old. Yeah, uh, yeah. Which is unusual. They, they have the box taken on the line uh, in Aintree. For, they had it, booked it like five years ago and have been looking for a horse since then to run in the National. And he still has to qualify, I think. But uh, that's going to be a fascinating story in April. You were down at Goran Park on Thursday, right? I was, yeah. Uh, Tiesta's Chase Day. I think you've been down there a few days as well. It's a mad day. Where else in Ireland would you see, like, of a Thursday? <laughs> like, it looks like everything. Stops the county, really. Stops the county, yeah. I've yeah. been at the Melbourne Cup, but that stops the nation. But the Tiesta's definitely stops the county. It was thronged the other day. Like, there was people everywhere the other day. Good few of the Ballyhale lads were there with the, with the Tommy Moore Cup as well after winning the Club All Ireland the week before. Um, they keep that cup, yeah. Yeah, they they will keep that. They will keep that one. I'm not so sure about the other one, but they will definitely keep that one. The other one, John, just an article. Uh, the the Brogan cousins are in the Sunday Business Post. Oh. Um, it's about their their company pep talk mostly, but um, yeah, it's interesting stuff. It's worth a look. He, there was one little line that just jumped out for me. Um, they're talking about managers uh, need to be more coaches nowadays and figure out how to play to their strengths. Like telling people what to do is no longer the remit of managers. They need to inspire 
They need to demonstrate and teach resilience and they need to ensure that each person on their team is doing their best work. Which is very true, I think, that, it, that equates to all sports now. The manager needs to be an expert in some field as well, you know, it's not just a man, not just managing people, you know. Interesting, I thought. So, they need to be, what, psychologists as well as coaches? Or they need to have a psychologist in. But I, I, think, what, I think the meaning was the manager needs to be a coach, you know, as much as they have to be able to wear two hats, but they need to be able to get down. And I, when, when I was reading it, I just thought Andy Farrell, uh, as in he's had to learn how to be a manager, but he's a, he's a brilliant coach. But I think the most important thing for Andy Farrell is to get out and be a specific coach every day and to coach where he is, where he is his expertise is. And then he's to take that hat off and go in and manage and then be a sports psychologist in the evening, you know. You're getting the balance there. So yeah. the Joey Carberry thing, is he almost saying to Joey Carberry, OK, prove it? No, I think he's saying to him, because uh, Ross Byrne has been playing well, uh, I think he's saying, I, I, dude, in my head, in my interpretation was, why would you, ha- you have a young out half, you, tr- you want to pick three out halves and go with them all the way to the World Cup. Two of them are injury prone, right? And the other one is very young. So I think he went with, I think Ross Byrne is stability at the, in the position. S- very, more similar to Sexton as a player than Carberry. And Carberry, just form, you know, um, Form and an injury profile, I think, that hasn't worked against him. And he's not, he's getting there, but he's not the player he was before his injuries in 2019, I believe. But I think he can get there. I think he'll be at the World Cup because things will happen. <laughs> history, will happen. history tells us, you know. Yeah, Eamon Sweeney, the back of the Sunday Independent, always worth a read. Embrace our changing face. Uh, but Philly McMahon, uh, I'll just read this here, credit to his community, his county, the GA and Irish sport in general, the former Dublin Stars opposition to anti-immigrant protests in his native Ballymun has been a model of decency and intelligence. He goes on to write, uh, sport can play a useful role because it's an area where the contribution made by people from immigrant backgrounds has been spectacularly visible of late. Gavin Mazunu, Andrew Oma Bamadele, Chidozi Agbene, Adam Eda and Michael Obafemi feature prominently on our national men's soccer team. Rashid Adeleke and Israel Alatunde reached the finals of their events at last year's European Athletics Championships. Gabriel Dawson won European gold in boxing. And also people from all over have come here, worked hard, put down roots and raised families. Our children don't find anything remarkable about the fact that they've got classmates whose parents come from elsewhere. If they think about it at all, they probably consider it invigorating rather than disturbing. So why not continue making newcomers welcome rather than making life difficult for them? Well said by Eamon Sweeney. Yeah, and football and athletics showing, are actually, it actually looks like Irish society when you watch them now and go down to them, from kids up to the highest level, especially Rashidat and Bazunu and Oma Bamadeli. Like these are, these are going to be world-class athletes in their chosen sports. And it, I think it shines a light on the other sports that are very white, middle-class in, in a couple of sports in Ireland still, or not necessarily middle-class, but very, still very... Still very Irish white looking if you look at the other sports. There's a lot of work to be done in comparison to athletics and football. Uh, we have anything else in the. Yeah, I just wanted to. Finn Russell. Yeah, this is mad. The, like you, look, you open the pages of 66 and 67 of the, the Mail and you just see Finn Russell literally playing with fire and juggling fire. This is a. An Mail ex- on Sunday wins today, doesn't it? Yeah, this yeah. Is, uh, the pictures even here alone are brilliant. So this is an exclusive by Nick Simon. Just go through it quickly. So all the pictures are of Russell uh, juggling fire. Uh, sticks that have, are basically lit up at the end. He said, it's not dangerous, I swear. It says Finn <laughs> Russell wearing a cheeky grin as he juggles fire sticks in his back garden in Paris. It is close to 10pm. A dark night sky has fallen over the city and the rotating beam from the Eiffel Tower swoops overhead to a steady beat. This will make the flames bigger, he says, dipping the battens into a jar of white spirit that he fetched from the basement. Uh, as with rugby, Russell makes it look easy. I've juggled as long as I can remember, he says, flames whipping past his face. You start out with clubs and then you move on to fire. My dad taught me to do it like it's just Gregor Townsend's like see <laughs> see what I was trying to tell you he literally <laughs> juggles fire this madman it's great to it's great to learn more about guys like, oh, what do you want like I, I always think anytime you see an interview you don't really necessarily want to know about the game what are they going to tell you about the game no Nick Simon's good I was saying to you off yeah. air he did a very good piece with uh, Gerben Grobler after he left yeah. Munster after the, and I kind of got him to kind of step back and talk about the actual in the, the person who was remember yeah. he was just dragged over That's the right, coals yeah. because of a, a decision that was not made by him you know you want to know more about yeah, Nick's, the, the Nick's, fella but Nick's good at getting person. into the living room with yeah. people and having a chat Yeah. every time I see him now Finn Russell this is all I'll be yeah, thinking. Like yeah. But also, maybe my point is the fact that, that well, maybe he's so relaxed on the pitch for that reason. Maybe there's a little link. Yeah, maybe so. Yeah, um, what you were saying. Banshee is yeah. the same. It's, it's, it's so refreshing to have rugby lads who are not 
robots chatting away to you and being willing to sit down and talk a bit about their lives and about what's going on around them, you know, because it's also, it can be all kind of, and this is across all sports, it can all be kind of too regimented sometimes. I think it know. inspires other people and inspiring sports people to be themselves as well and have, you were talking with the soccer guys there, to have interests outside of whatever you're doing yeah. to keep, you know, help your sanity off the pitch but it'll probably help you play better on it as well. Yeah, and when you're under the most horrendous pressure in the world, yeah. it'll test your character, yeah. Like this guy's juggled with fire, like what's a, what's a kick to win a game to him like? Yeah, just what what these Scottish Gregor towns in though? Can you imagine? <laughs> but also, is this a frustration in Jay that we don't get enough of that, and it's it's all kind of put, put behind the closed doors? Ah, oh, yeah, it is. It's hard in comparison hard to covering a horse racing. It's it's vast. Is this because? Yeah, horse racing is brilliant. Like yeah, like even just some some of the details about the Charlie Mullins you know, injuring himself playing indoor soccer or whatever. You, like the Joe Canning Laker Gale, for instance, the other day, we probably got in that what we maybe wanted throughout Joe's career but you have to be I suppose he maybe got stung by the media um, as a young player particularly those comments in between the replay uh, the draw game, draw game and the replay in 2012 uh, we definitely need a bit more access and it needs to be uh, a little less sterilised shall we say Have you recovered Gavin Comiskey from the World Cup yet? Yeah, I, I, my, I, I, I must have been, I collapsed actually when I got back physically, like on my back and neck and over, just in too much travelling for a 40, 43 year old, I think. But yeah, I'm, fly, I'm flying now, yeah. It's a great experience actually. What, was, what were the takeaways, the final presumably was it? But the takeaways were, well, the football still, I still pinch myself that I was at all those Moroccan games in that World Cup yes. final. Um, I still, it, I remember I was sitting beside either side of Gav Cooney and Ken Early either side of me for the World Cup final and both of them were just like I can't believe this is happening what are we watching it was bizarre you know and we kept trying to restart match reports because everything was going in, yeah, out the window yeah. that was brilliant That I always talk about how it, it was the best sporting event I've ever done it was it was kind of a childhood dream mind to cover a football World Cup but you didn't think it would happen and it was happening it was brilliant and sport was out of this world, truly. I'm hearing but I will butt. never go back to Doha again. It was such a cruel place if you're not one of the haves. If you're a have-not, it's a terribly cruel place and it's a lot of loneliness. Just men working to earn enough money to send home to their families from parts, the poorest parts of the world and, you know, just groups of men. It was like 80%, the population is 80% male. It's, it just, it was dystopian. It didn't didn't feel like real a real place, a real world. It was really cruel and it, it seeps into your brain even though you're covering the it's such a thrilling and and the smoothness of getting to tournaments and getting to games and everything and the food and the media everything was really really like set up for you to do a good job um, and then you just see how tired security guards are at the stadiums you're working at the same guys every yeah. day no days off at the wor- no days off while FIFA were here was the catchphrase everyone kept saying when you met them you know D- doesn't say a lot for humanity in ways no it just it t- uh, not to get too deep yeah, on it but yeah. it told me that humanity just has never changed and like if you don't have regulation if you don't look after certain people in certain workforces we as a, as a society as a human race will always be will always lean towards <laughs> I hate slavery you know it was yeah, okay. it was very disturbing okay. but a brilliant a brilliant experience at the same time Alright Gavin Comiskey from the Irish Times and Michael Verney from the Irish Independent thank you so much for reviewing the papers today Sure John pleasure uh, Mead 312 Cork 16 points in uh, Division 2 so Mead set to win that Roscommon 2-9 Tyrone 1-9 in Division 1 and Lance 6 points Clare 3 and also we have uh, Donegal 6 points Kerry 1-6 in the football leagues we're going to have Paul Kerrigan reviewing that Cork Mead game and plenty more to come between 3 and 4 and then Brian Kerr and Dermot Looney between 4 and 5 on the history of St. Pat's Golf Weekly the best of that to come so much on Off the Ball here on Sunday until 7 we're back after the news don't go away don't miss a thing follow at Newstalk FM on Instagram